of the Acts of the Apostles. I'm going to begin in reading there with verse number 6. About noon I came to Damascus. Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Today we look at the story of the life of a man named Saul, also called Paul, who was so important as he came to know Jesus Christ. Paul was the writer of the majority of the New Testament, a man who traveled around most of the known world to all kinds of places and languages, sharing about who Jesus was. And yet we know that earlier in his life he had started as someone who persecuted the church. Someone who thought that these new Christians, these people who followed Christ, were doing a disservice to God. They were dishonoring God so that he thought his role was to bring God's justice and judgment onto those to persecute them, to pursue them, to arrest them, to make them stop by any means necessary. But a funny thing happened to Paul, or Saul. When he was on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. And when you meet Jesus, you change. He changes people. He realized in that voice that all the things that he had been doing for God, he was wrong. That Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. That he was the truth. And that he had a plan for Paul's life. And so Paul submitted to that. When he was blinded by the light, he continued to obey God. And he went to the place to talk with the person that God had told him to do. And these words were told to him again that you will be his witness to the people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. That God had laid claim on Paul's life. But Paul was not unique in that regard. He was unique in many ways, but not in the regard that God had made a claim on his life, as God makes a claim on everyone's life. That he is calling us into his service. And to conclude that, he asked that they would be baptized to wash away sin by the calling of his name. And while most of us have probably not seen a bright light or even heard a voice from heaven when we felt that call from God, we do know what it is like to have God calling, because God is still calling people. And he's still asking that those who know him are his witnesses. That they would bear witness and share what they have seen and heard with the world that is around them. That they share about the impact, the difference that God has made in transforming their lives. So today, we will join in the ordinance of baptism. That we have three people who have expressed a desire to come together and to be baptized today as a witness publicly for Jesus Christ. Now, they know, as well as I hope all of us know, that what we will do in that pool today when we enter that water, that water is not supernatural. That water does not have the capacity to wash away sin. It is only by the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that baptism is, in fact, an outward sign of an inward grace. That what we do there is a reminder of what has already happened in the lives of Steve and Robin and Shelby. That the moment they accepted Jesus Christ, that he came in and he washed their sins away. But in obedience, we fulfill this action in the water as a physical representation of what had already happened internally inside of them. That it is that tangible reminder. Because we all need baptism. 
And baptism in water is important, but it is far not as important as the baptism that Sue read about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is able to come in the life of every believer the moment that they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes into our life as our counselor, as our advisor, as one who creates a new conscience inside of us and guides us in our lives. It is an idea that we are submitting ourselves to understand that God is the one who now has authority in our lives. And today, Shelby and Robin and Steve will enter into that pool and they will bear witness to the thing that has already transpired in their hearts and in obedience to God. That God has that power to forgive sins and to wash us clean of the things that we have done and to remove the punishment that we have earned away from us. That if we allow him to do so, he's willing to do so for every single person. That he takes whatever we have done wrong in our past whatever we are doing wrong in our present, whatever we would even do wrong in the future, that God has the capacity to take those things and wash them away. The symbol of baptism is many things, but one of those things is an ultimate symbol of forgiveness. That it is able to remove those things and no longer count them against us, that it cleanses us. I think of the story of John, who occurs with a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, and she is brought by the Pharisees, those who are keeping the religious law, to Jesus to ask what should be done with her. And her re his reply is, where are your accusers? Did not even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. We have a story of a woman who was caught in the act of adultery who knew, confessed, admitted that she had done these things. She had done something outside of God's will. And according to the Jewish law, the deserved punishment for that was death. And despite knowing what she deserved in that case, what she reserved was something far different. It was the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior. By the definition of the law, the Pharisees were right. That is what the law said deserved to happen. But God so often doesn't give us what we have earned. He gives us something far more wonderful and gracious if we allow him to do so. He gave that mercy. This is a woman who literally was looking death in the eyes. Now, it was against Roman law at the time to execute someone for this, but sometimes the Romans turned their eyes to things like that, depending on what was best for public relations. So she literally could have died that day. And although we are not all adulterers, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we are all sinners and the wages of sin is death, that every one of us has sinned, that we are separated from God, and that we have earned death. But that Jesus Christ, by his work on the cross, took the punishment for death. He took the punishment for our sins, that we now have the capacity to know him. You know, we all know what it's like to be covered in, in filth and things. I mean, everyone here has done some hard labor. I'm sure you've been out doing a roof or out working hard in a field or or just even camping for a few days and just covered in dirt and grime and filth and stink. And you know what that's like. And you know what? That's what our lives are like. We cover it with our own sin and filth and stink and corruption. And then Jesus shows up. And we're like, oh man, I'm not ready. I'm so filthy and dirty. But Jesus looks at us because Jesus isn't there to play dress up or have a little tea party or something. He's there to help cleanse us, to remove that filth and stench from our lives and wash and bathe us and create us again new. That baptism is an ultimate reminder that we are a forgiven people before God, that God has that capacity of forgiveness. As Roman 8 begins with these beautiful words that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That he doesn't count it against us anymore. That he takes our sin and he throws it as far as the east is from the west. And that's pretty far. That we all have those sins that weigh us down, guilt and shame and condemnation. We think about the past things that we've done that have caused hurt in our lives, the lives of others, and hurt God for those things. And sometimes we feel like our past mistakes, our errors, our sin, that they're engraved or they're tattooed onto the very essence of who we are. But that is not true. There is nothing in which God cannot come in and cleanse away. There is nothing that is permanently written upon us that God cannot remove. Then his holy and cleansing power of his blood can wash it away and create in us new to remove the guilt of that sin. And not only does he do that, he doesn't bring it back up. He doesn't wait for opportunities to throw it in our face. He simply chooses to ignore it and love us. In fact, he even goes one further by offering us the Holy Spirit to guide us that we may be convicted of sin and move on to do the things that are right. 
But it's also, baptism is another important reminder, is that it is about death and life. That when we go under the water, the symbol that the old order of things, the things that have been before are now gone. And then when we rise out of that water, we are in fact a new life we created. It is a tangible reminder of that new life that God is offering to us. Because as Jesus said to that woman, who was caught in the act of adultery, go and to sin no more. That every single one of us have habitual sins, that we have bad habits, that we have wrong behavior, wrong attitudes, and things that are translucent into our lives, and that we need those things removed. And that baptism is a symbol of going in and saying, you know what, I'm going to allow God to work in my life, remove those things, and I'm going to follow who he is. That is a picture of dying to our old order of self and rising into a new order of self. As Romans 6, 6 tells us that we know the old self was crucified with him so that our body might be done away with. That we would no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And we are open then to the possibility of following who Jesus is. Not only have we been forgiven, but we have now left those things behind us. That we have, by, by definition or by example perhaps, to say that our old life was like an old garment, soiled and terrible and stenchy, and we discard it. And that God offers us something beautiful and white and new to put on. Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 3 says, All that were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That the new clothes, the new thing that we wear, is our holiness or our justification in Christ. And although we continue to be led by Christ, he continues to work on our lives so that we are able to put to death those things that are outside of his will. It was C.S. Lewis, the theologian, who once said that a Christian is not a person who does nothing wrong, but it is a person who understands when they do something wrong that they repent. They start over again each and every time they stumble. And they can do so because of the work of Jesus Christ. See, we're not going to be perfect people, but with the awareness and guidance of the Holy Spirit, he will work into our lives and convict us of the things that are outside of his will, and that we are able to change and ask for him to transform those things about us. Because ultimately, a call to baptism is a call to surrender, a call to give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, that when we are exposed and vulnerable and dependent, and sometimes we don't like to feel that way, but when we do, we know that there is one who is completely competent, who is able to come in and in the midst of our insecurity, embrace us and love us and accept us. And that is God who acknowledges our need for Christ. Because what um, Shelby and Steve and Robin are doing today, but above all things, is saying this, I need Jesus. And I need more of Jesus. And I want Jesus to come in and be more important and guiding in my life as he continues to work and transform me into being who he wants me to be. And then I'm willing to do those things and allow them to work in my life. I am so grateful for the opportunity that we have to baptize these three people. What a blessing they have personally been to me and I'm sure to each and every member of the people here in our congregation. I just wanted to shortly just talk a little bit about each one of them. When I first met Shelby, I met her the longest of the three people being baptized. I first met uh, Shelby uh, at the funeral of her uh, mother-in-law, um, and I think Shelby would probably self-report that she wasn't always a very uh, happy or content person at that moment. She felt some hurt and grudges at different moments in her life. And after her husband, unfortunately, uh, passed away, I got to know Shelby a lot more. And I got to understand Shelby and her honesty and her vulnerability. And when she um, would speak to me, she so quickly, and I, I have very rarely ever met someone who so quickly wanted to know more about God, that she just immersed herself in coming to church and Bible study and Sunday school and just wanted to know more about God. And in fact, so quickly took up reading the Bible that she was always quoting the Bible to me in different passages that she had learned and different commentaries and how she would come up with just wanting to read one passage. And then next thing she knows, she read the entire book of Romans in one sitting and applied these things uh, into her life. And what a blessing it is to see a life that had been transformed that helped remove all these things that were holding her back, uh, the relationships and the pain, some of the things that she had experienced in her past that God brought reconciliation to those things. And we are so grateful that she is a, a real means of inspiration to me, and I'm so grateful that I'm able to be a part of her baptism today. I 
think of Robin, who I've known the least amount of time, who contacted me just a short time uh, before Easter this past year. And I was on a Facebook post. I noticed, like, because I'm, I'm always checking Facebook to find out if anyone likes anything or anything. And I saw Robin liked it, and I'm like, I asked this, you know, contact, contact. And she's like, well, I'm looking for a church. I might show up sometime. And I thought, that's great. And I was so pleasantly surprised when she actually did that. Uh, she showed up at Easter at the sunrise service for the first time. I'm in here like, hey, don't I know you? Didn't I just comment on your post a few days ago? And then her and her wonderful husband, George, have been coming to our fellowship over time. Uh, and Robin wasn't a person who immediately says a whole lot uh, at first. Um, but as I've gotten to know her, she's a person of great vulnerability and honesty. Um, who was so able to talk about it in a very transparent and real way about hurts and pains and difficulties that have occurred in her life because she so wants to not only use her life as a blessing to see how God has transformed and, and worked in her life, but so that other people may know about the beauty of testimony, the things that God has done in her life. And I'm so grateful um, for that opportunity to know Robin and to continue to get to know Robin in the upcoming months and years ahead uh, as she participates and becomes more part of our fellowship. And lastly, the person that will be baptized today is Steve. I first met Steve at a yard sale that we had at church, and Steve came in and he had some questions because he had been thinking about coming to this church for a long time, and I think we had talked, I don't know, an hour and a half, two and a half hours, somewhere in there. Uh, Steve had a lot of questions at the yard sale. We were talking, the yard sale was over. Uh, I know at that time that um, his father, unfortunately, had a lot of health concerns, and we weren't able to see him for a few months. Uh, but then... Unfortunately, after his father passed away, and Steve was able to come, and he's joined our fellowship, and he's been a part of us ever since. And I don't know if you've talked to Steve that much, but he uh, grew up with a wonderful um, mother and father who were a pastor and a pastor's wife who sacrificed an immense, an, an immense amount of the things that they had to do um, for God's kingdom. That I just marvel, I, I truly marvel at the things that they were able to do and the faithfulness um, and the things that they did. And uh, um, a please. Let your mom know when you see her how much I appreciate the things that she has done in your life and continue to do. And uh, it's such a blessing. But I do know, too, that Steve has shared with me, and I don't think it's anything that I can share, is that, um, you know, there were some hurts in his life, too. Because there's hurts in all of our lives. And that by coming together, you know, that God heals us. And that God has been active in helping and healing the things that hurt. Steve, is he... Hills Robin and Shelby and myself and every single one of us. Because that's who God is, to bring us into reconciliation, to bring us into obedience. And that's what baptism is about. It's about these beautiful three individuals who are coming together in their faithfulness and their desire to want to know more about who Jesus is. And I so hope that, I know it's a little bit cool out and uh, the things like that today, but I hope most of you, or at least a great portion of you, are able to come and to share with us in that baptismal service that will occur right after our service today. Uh, because I think it will be a great blessing. Would you all join with me in praying? God, thank you for who you are. I'm so excited to be able to share this important day, be blessed uh, for Robin and Shelby, uh, for Steve and for their families, encouraged by their desire to continue uh, to serve you more closely and deeply. Thank you for them. I so appreciate their willingness to stand before you publicly and in a moment share testimonies about who they are. Thank you for bringing them to us so that they could love us as we love them, that we can bless them as they bless us. We thank you, God, for yourself, for your Son, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the cross and for the forgiveness of sin. And we thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.